decided to follow Jesus. I have decided now presenting Gospel Restoration with Dempsey Williams from Montana Street Church of Christ. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again once to our weekly Bible study. We'll continue our study in the Old Testament to show you how the Old Testament relates to the New Testament. The Old Testament was a shadow of the good things to come. And in Romans chapter 15, verses so these things were written for our learning. We should be able to learn from the examples presented, how God dealt with sin, how God dealt with people, and how he will deal with us one day. So we need to, to understand, we need at least to know how God dealt with, with the children of Israel as they are coming out of um, slavery. And last week, last time, lesson we showed, we talked about how God set up the tabernacle in the wilderness so his people could worship him. And as they traveled on, finally they got to the promised land and God was ready to let them go into the promised land that he had promised Abraham. God promised Abraham that I, I will give your seed all of this land where Abraham traveled way back in days gone by. But uh, as Moses traveled, Moses is now an old man. They've been traveling in the wilderness 40 years. They're, they have a, they're approaching the promised land. But Moses knew that he would never be allowed to enter into the promised land. Moses would be allowed to see it. But because he had disobeyed or he had made up some mistakes, he was, and God would, was not going to allow him to enter into the promised land. And we're going to read in Deuteronomy chapter 34, the final days of Moses, he'd been serving the Lord for, for a long time. When God called him and told him to go into, into Egypt to get his people out of slavery, he was 80 years old. Remember his first 40 years, he was in Egypt being raised as the, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was being groomed to be Pharaoh, but when he had problems with them and he had to flee, he went, spent 40 years out in the wilderness with Jethro and tending sheep. Then God called him to go back into Israel and get his people out of slavery. He got them, brought them back to the mountain, gave them the law, set up the tabernacle. Now Moses is, is approaching the end of his life and he's, he can see the promised land, but he, can, he can't go into it. And this is the, the last chapter in the book of Deuteronomy and it tells the final days what happened to Moses. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the lands of Gilead unto Dan, and all of Naphtali, and the lands of Ephraim, and Manassas, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plains of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give unto thy seed, and they and have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Hmm. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses was ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on, upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and all the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, in, in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land, in all and in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed <coughs> in the sight of Israel. So Moses' service to God has ended, and God has uh, called him up on a mountain, and they didn't see Moses anymore. Now the mantle has been passed on to Joshua. Joshua is now the new leader, and they are approaching the city of Jericho. 
this is the first land that they're going to conquer as they go into the promised land. The promised land, God promised it to them, but it's full of people. They have to go in there and kill the people, wipe the people out, or, or kick them out of their land. So Joshua is the leader. The first thing he does, he sends two spies into Jericho to spy out the land. When they went into Jericho, they went into a harlot's house named Rahab. She hid the spies when they certainly would have been caught by the, the officers and they would have surely been seized and killed. Joshua chapter 2. Let's just read a part of that narrative. Because Rahab <laughs> has been memorialized for all times in the Bible. Her name is not only mentioned here in Joshua chapter 2, but she's mentioned in the New Testament. But we'll read the, the, the account in, in Joshua chapter 2. and says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men of, to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in thither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and, thus, and said thus, They came two men unto me, but I wish not whence they were. Yeah, those two guys came in last, but I don't know what happened to them. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whether the men went, I would not. Pursue after them quickly, for they shall overtake them. This is what she told the king. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them from the, with, the, with the stalks of flax, which she had hid in order, she had laid in order upon the roof. And the, the men pursued after them the way of to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up, up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto them, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what he did unto the two kings of the Amorites, that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom he utter, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God of heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto me and to my father's house and give me a true token. And that ye shall save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all they that, ha that they have and deliver our lives from death. Now he's talk she's talking to the two spies. She's trying to make a deal with the two spies that, that Joshua has sent in. And the men answered her, out of our lives for yours. If you utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the wall, the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get ye to the mountains, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the, in the window which thou hast let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household, household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall be shall go out of the doors of the house into the street. His blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou sh utter this our business, then we will be quit of th th this thine oath which thou hast made to swear. And she said, According to thy word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window. So here is another example of some pa a pagan woman who saw the handwriting on the wall. They saw that they were going to be conquered. And so she made a deal with these spies. When what she should have did was turn them spies over to the king. And, uh, but that still wouldn't have made any difference. It would only have had an adverse on her, her own personal family and household. But she, they made a deal with her. So you hang this scarlet 
cord in your window. It's just like the Passover. When the Passover came and the death angel came, when he saw the blood around the doorpost and the lamb, he passed over him. They had a Jewish holiday. That's what that's all about. So Rahab had a similar agreement with, with uh, the spies that, that Joshua had sent in. And then she had to hang this scarlet cord in the window. And when they came in and conquered jo the city of, uh, of um, what's the city? Jericho, they allowed her to remain alive, and she did not get killed like all the rest of the people. So they are approaching the Jordan River. Jordan River, before they get to Jericho, they have to get across the Jordan River. Now, when they approach the Jordan River, they, the priests were commanded by God to, to take the Ark of the Covenant and, and go through the Jordan River. And, and as soon as the, as the priest's feet touched the water, the waters divided. And the children of Israel went across the Jordan River just like they went through the Red Sea on dry ground. So remember <clears throat> that when the children of Israel came out of, of Egyptian slavery and God sent them through the Red Sea, there were maybe a million men. Now this is a whole generation later and most of the people alive, and I never, never saw that miracle, and they never experienced it. But now here God is renewing and showing him how powerful he is by parting the Jordan River. In Numbers chapter 26, uh, we sh it shows you that out of all of those men that came out of Egypt, and there was only a couple, and, and the two of them were the two spies that Joshua had sent into to Jericho to spy out the land. In Numbers chapter 26, verses 63, a long chapter in the Bible, it says this, These are they that were numbered by Moses and Eleazar, the priests, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. But among these there was not a man of whom Moses and Aaron, the priests, numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai for the Lord said of them they shall surely die in the wilderness and there was not left a man of them save Caleb son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun so out of all of those men that came out of, of Egyptian slavery and crossed through the Red Sea and God part of the Red Sea <coughs> excuse me only two or maybe three Joshua Caleb and the two, the two spies, these are the same two spies that were sent into, into Jericho to spy out the land. So here again we have another hint of how God deals with people. You know, he, Jesus taught in, uh, in John chapter 14, 7 verses 14. He said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few that be that find it. Surely this um, was... Another example of the few, considering how many people came out of slavery, that were actually able to go into the promised land. But there were thousands who, who were executed because of the, by the fiery serpent, thousands that were executed when they were worshiping the golden calf. And as this time and again, there were a number of them who were executed while they were out in the wilderness. And the major problem that the people had was staying faithful to God. They just were so used to their pagan ways, it, was, it seemed so difficult for the people to be faithful to the Lord for any period of time. So the faithful Jews who crossed the Jordan River subdued and possessed the promised land, the, God, the land that God promised Abraham. They possessed it before Joshua died. All the land was conquered, and they divided the land up to the different tribes, and all this was accomplished before Joshua died. After Joshua died, we have a very difficult period where the people were ruled by judges. Judges led the people when they, there was a need for military leadership. But there was no, uh, the people were united under God, but there was no central government that controlled everybody. As soon as the leader that God would raise up to lead the people in military, the people would go right back to their paganism and to their idolatry, and God would get upset. He would get angry with them, cause them to lose in battle and all this misfortune. And then when they would repent and come back to God, he would raise up another judge who would lead them back to righteousness and, and right relationship with God. 
And when the people went into the promised land, a major problem was they didn't kill everybody. They didn't kick everybody out of the land. They left some people there and they had to pay tribute. But they intermingled with these people and they related. They gave them their daughters and their sons and they intermarried. And these were pagans, people who, who had been following uh, Nimrod and paganism all the way from way back uh, from the Tower of Babel when paganism really got another foothold in society. So the people had, a, they had a, just a, an undying need to, to go back and follow into paganism. And it was because of the influence of the people that they reacted with who were still in the promised land that they didn't get rid of. These people had a powerful influence towards Israel. And in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, the same thing holds true today. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 33, says, gives this warning. It says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners, or evil companions corrupt good morals. See, God had told Israel not to, in, to marry with these pagans, but they, they wouldn't listen. And these uh, spouses were able to lead many of God's people back into paganism and to idolatry. Now, there were a number of judges uh, that ruled during this time period and led the people. And they were great warriors and great leaders militarily. And one was a female. There was one judge named Deborah who was also a prophetess. And you had the, the left-handed judge. His name was Ehud. And you had Shamgar. And perhaps the most famous of all that you may not remember those name by name, but surely everybody's heard of Samson, the great strong man of the Old Testament who picked up the, the gate to the city and carried it up a mountain and wrestled with lions and bears and killed 10,000 men with the jawbone of a jackass. This was a great man who, in whom the Spirit of God allowed him to do these great things. But he was just one of many of the judges that God sent when the people would repent God would send a judge and he would lead them in victory in battle and lead them hopefully back to the right relationship with God. But Samson, he was kind of a hard-headed judge, but from a child, you know, he was set us apart to be, to be a judge. And his final act was to destroy a pagan temple with all the people there had come there on a, on a weekend afternoon to watch uh, watch them make a sport out of Joshua. Um, in Joshua chapter 21, verses 25, uh, Joshua judges. Joshua chapter 21, verses 25. It says, hmm, am I reading right here? Joshua 21, verses 25, says, And out of the half-tribe of Manasseh, Tanak with her suburbs, and gath Rimon with her suburbs, two cities. Uh, I don't think that's the right place. This is a description of the different tribes uh, that, and how they were dividing the promised land up among the different tribes. Anyway, Samson was captured. His eyes were poked out, and they were using him to, gr to grind grain and everything. And then finally, they had him before all the people in the temple, and they were making sport of him. And he asked God to once more give him his strength back. And he had his hands placed upon the pillars of the temple, and he, he pushed real hard, and he pushed those pillars down. All the temple fell in, and, 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 and thousands of people were killed that were there to, to make fun of Samson. That's how we ended. But uh, this period of judges was a very difficult part in Bible history. And it's, it's despic, depicted in the last book of Judges. I think uh, the very last chapter, it gives a description of this particular era. It says in, in uh, Judges chapter 21, verses 25, says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes.
Can you imagine the situation if everybody, and that's sort of like what we living in, what we see in the world today is everybody's doing his own thing. He's doing what's right in his own eyes instead of doing the things that are right in God's eyes and realize that we're here to serve God. And that is our purposes should be subservient to the purposes of God. Because it says that all things, in Romans chapter 8, verses 20, 28, all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. Very big difference. When you become a Christian, now your purpose is not in, li in life is not to glorify self, not to get rich, not to get famous, but to glorify God. Now, the last judge was Samuel. He was a great man who, from a child, his mother prayed for a child in, in uh, the book of 1 Samuel. She had uh, been chided by her husband's uh, other wife because his husband uh, had a lot of children. Elkanah was his name. It, the woman's name was Hannah. And uh, Penina was always uh, aggravating and poking at her because she didn't have any children. So she was very bitter. And every year she would go to the temple. Well, let's just read that, that experience. First Samuel chapter 1, starting with verses 4. It says, and when, the time that was that, and when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all of her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion. Or and he gave, in other words, he gave a double portion to Hannah because he loved Hannah. For he loved Hannah, it says that. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary, which was Penina, also provoked her, provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. She was teasing her and aggravating her because she didn't have any children. And as he did so year by year, when he went up to the house of the Lord, so he, she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said all Canna her husband unto her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they drank. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon the seat by the post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord, and she wept sore, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look upon the affliction of thy handmaiden, remember me and not forget thine handmaiden, but will give unto thine handmaiden a child, a man child. Then will I give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. So Hannah said, Lord, if you'll give me a son, I will give him back to you, and he will be a servant of the Lord all the days of his life. And this was Samuel. And when Samuel was born, and after he was weaned, Hannah took him to the temple and gave him to Eli to serve in whatever capacity Eli saw fit to use him. So one night, God spoke to Samuel, and he called Samuel by name. And that's in 1 Samuel chapter 3, the next chapter. And it tells that, that, that God called Samuel. See, Samuel was a prophet. God spoke directly to him. This is what the, a prophet does. He takes messages from God and delivers him, them to the people. First Samuel chapter 3 says, And the child Samuel ministered unto, unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days, and there was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time that when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down again, and the Lord called yet again, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel rose up again and ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not, my son. Go lie down again. And Samuel did not yet know, neither the Lord was the word, Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. See, Samuel's still a child. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, did, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down. And it shall be that if he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called it as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. So it goes on to say that God told 
Samuel that the, the end of Eli's house had come because Eli had not disciplined his sons to do what is right before the Lord. And so that was going to be a, Eli finally got, Samuel didn't want to tell him what the Lord had told him, but, but Eli finally got Samuel to tell him what the Lord had said, but he, it was not good news. Samuel had to tell him that uh, because of his, he didn't discipline his sons, that the end of his name and of his reign and of his period was to end. But the, the very wonderful and beautiful thing is the attitude of Samuel and what Eli told Samuel to say. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. The Lord speaks to us now through his word, through the New Testament, through, the, through Christ. And as God spoke in the cloud, when, when Moses appeared, they were out on this Mount of Transfiguration and and, and Moses appeared, and Elijah appeared, and Christ was transfigured, and, 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 and Peter jumped up and said, Oh, Lord, it's good that we should be here. We'll, let us build a tabernacle, just like the one in the middle. Let's build a tabernacle for Moses, and a tabernacle for Elijah to represent the prophets, and a tabernacle for Jesus. God, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And that is God's will for us today, that we hear Jesus. The prophets foretold Jesus would come. The prophets told many different details from, from Samuel on. Every prophet that spoke for God had something to say about Jesus, the Messiah, or something about his church. When the first church first began, before the New Testament was written, all that the apostles had to preach on was the Old Testament. And you had prophets like Isaiah and Daniel that gave detailed prophecy, prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ. When Christ hung on the cross, in the last words he said, it is finished. Everything that they had written about him in prophecy came to pass. And he knew it, everything had come to pass. Now he was ready to give his life as a sacrifice on the cross that he might redeem you and me from our sins and that he might reconcile us back to God through faith in Jesus Christ. That was God's plan from the beginning. Everything that happened before that was preparation for the gospel. Everything that happened was a shadow. Christ is the true image. All of the things and the types and the antitypes of the Old Testament were shadows of the Son of God, the matchless Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. You need to, to recognize Jesus and his position and his authority and acknowledge that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man's coming to the Father except through him. Consider your life and consider the life the Lord would have you live and the way that you should follow God in this day and age for Jesus is the way. This has been Gospel Restoration with Dempsey Williams from Montana Street Church of Christ.